Thank you, Angelo, for the introduction. <coughs> Welcome back, everybody. So in the previous two editions of, uh, of the hands-on workshop, uh, the, the, there was only one talk on, on data analytics, machine learning kind of things that I have been giving. Uh, and as you see today, there is a full session. And actually, there is also another talk by Michele Ceriotti on, uh, on the last day that is Again, data analytics, machine learning, dimensionality reduction is one aspect. So today I will focus only on one aspect uh, of, of uh, uh, data analytics, that is kind of uh, umbrella name for machine learning, compressed sensing, um, data mining, and so on. And uh, the general motivation, um, so Gabor has already a little bit um, um, distinguished uh, 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 between two different ways to, to, to look at, uh, at the machine learning or data analytics problem. Actually, I will also have a slide on these two ways. Um, let me start uh, by saying what we want to achieve by using the methods that I will be presenting in this uh, lecture. Uh, the idea uh, is to uh, kind of uh, uh, accelerate the discovery of new materials. And uh, by using uh, 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 computers and, and algorithms in such a way that we accelerate what has been, do been done many times in the past. One notable example is the uh, periodic table of elements. And I like to show the original, actually the second version of uh, Mendeleev's periodic table of element. Uh, there were many competitors at that time, and Deleyev was the winner, because nowadays we know why this table is correct. Um, and he uh, fancies something that looks uh, very similar to the modern table by just looking at how uh, elements react with uh, uh, so the stoichiometry of the reaction with oxygen and hydrogen, and just by using the atomic uh, uh, weight that was what was known. Of course, they didn't know anything about atomic number by then. Um, so the amazing thing here is not only the structure that uh, is very similar to the modern table, of course, if you abstract a little bit, but you see that the columns and the rows are basically the modern ones, but the fact that uh, Mendeleev predicted missing elements. So he says, well, between zinc and uh, arsenic, there is something in between because uh, there is, I, I don't see anything with this uh, atomic weight that uh, reacts in this way with uh, uh, with oxygen and hydrogen. And uh, years later, people found gallium and germanium with a pretty good uh, 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 prediction of uh, the, the, the actual atomic weight and behaving exactly as they should on this table. So the periodic table of element is done. There is nothing more we can discover. OK, we can have uh, something a bit uh, uh, with a uh, higher weight on the table, but not very useful, I think, for material science. Um, at least on, on Earth. Um, but we may uh, want to build a chart of materials now, so a combination of elements, and predict how they behave. So the, the goal, uh, oops, this was left from another talk, <laughs> so is, um, uh, is to predict uh, uh, materials uh, properties. And I will show something about uh, the prediction of ground state uh, of crystal structures. Uh, here in this talk, novel topological insulator, not uh, materials. Uh, and, uh, and also whether material is a, is a metal or non-metal. But first, I have to introduce the methodologies to do this. And then on the long run, we would like to aim uh, a bit higher and predict the materials for actual uh, useful application, right? So targeting an application, find the best material doing something. So as um, I was saying, uh, Gabor has basically already said this, uh, this thing. I, I, I use a different wording, but the same concept. So there are basically nowadays two uh, approaches that I think will merge uh, in the near future, actually. I call one the configurational way. So that basically is machine learn simplified many body uh, Hamiltonians, what you call these surrogate models, right? Uh, and uh, in this class, I would put uh, cluster expansion. We will act, you will actually see tomorrow. Uh, full, uh, uh, you will have a full tutorial on cluster expansion, the Gaussian approximation potential, uh, the kernel regression using Coulomb metrics or other uh, kernels, and so on. The idea is that you use uh, um, 
you define a, a chemical space, so you have some, some chemical uh, species. And importantly, you have uh, your training material is list of label configurations. So you have configuration to which you attach uh, some information that you have and you want to learn. And you want to learn some property that typically is the energy and forces. Typically, in this field, people are after uh, potential, empirical potential or force field. You have seen that it is quite uh, uh, successful and under the active development. The problem may be that if you learn something for a specific uh, uh, set of uh, chemical elements, uh, you may have a hard time in transferring uh, what you have learned on a, a different chemical elements. Sometimes even changing the composition could be uh, hard if uh, something has been missed by, by the configuration. The other approach, kind of complementary, I call it the chemical space way, and basically will be devoted on this um, approach in this, um, in this talk, and it is also my main uh, uh, research topic, is try to learn physical rules, I dare not really call them laws, but at least rules, in order to predict properties, in some way also take into account the configuration, because at the end of the day, atoms uh, have to be in some configuration in space before they can have some, show some property in a class of material. So here, differently from, from, from here, we have uh, the input as list of labeled composition. So we have composition of material that has certain value of a property or is classified in a certain way, and you want to predict the property for um, things that you have not seen yet. Well, you start from predicting from what you have seen already, just to <laughs> validate the model, uh, or train the model, sorry. Uh, the problem here would be that if you don't have any information about the configuration, uh, the structure of things that you are uh, investigating, uh, if there are polymorphs, so things with the same composition and different structure, you may be missing that if you don't give this information explicitly, or you find an indirect way to give this. But again, so we would like to have this uh, learning. So I give you a composition of a material and you say this is a superconductor or not, or better, I give you a class of materials that are superconductors and not superconductors and then you find a new one that has not been seen, new composition, new, new material. That is a superconductor, for example, yes. Okay, I have a guinea pig uh, kind of example uh, in order to um, introduce the methodologies that we have been using. So this is the prediction um, of whether uh, a certain class of octet binaries form a, a rock salt or zinc blend uh, crystal structure. So the octet binaries are made by combining the first with the seventh group, second with the sixth in the periodic table. If you stare a little bit, you see that this periodic table is a little bit strange. I put uh, copper and silver here because in this kind of example, they behave like 1s and, and this 2s, 2s, so I took out a couple of elements from here and put there for my amusement. And um, so if we want to predict whether these things form rock salt and zinc blend, uh, it may not be trivial. I mean, it's easy to predict that if you combine this with this uh, group, you get uh, a rock salt because the, the kind of bonding is ionic. And if you do a combination of carbon with silver and so on, you most likely get a, a zinc blend because the, 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 the binding will be covalent. But in all the other cases, that might be not easy. Now, we want to predict if something crystallizes one of the two structures. Let's use the periodic table, actually even less than periodic table, just the, 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 the information on, on, on the atomic species, atomic charge, and I, I color rose, uh, red zinc blend, blue rock salt, and uh, and green though that, though that has, uh, are a little bit in between the two structures, so the, 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 the energy of formation of the two structures is uh, almost degenerate, according to the LDA calculation, just to make it clear. Um, and okay, yeah, okay, you see that there is some structure for the groups uh, and, and, uh, and periods in the, in the periodic table, but it will be difficult to, uh, to uh, predict something if you remove uh, some data points or even a full group of data points, uh, whether this will be blue or red. What we would actually would like to, to have is a chart. So something which everything here is a rock salt, for example, everything here is zinc blend. And even more interesting, everything that is in between is really in between, so that we don't misclassify things. 
So this is, I said, is a kind of guinea pig uh, example, but it's not totally uh, trivial or, or, or uh, um, without any interest. Uh, that, that there have been many people that have been uh, thinking about this problem and publish uh, as a consequence uh, uh, starting from the late 60s. All these people, except the, this paper here, have been using their chemical intuition and understanding. Uh, we would like to, and they found solution, I'll try to show one in the next uh, slide. Uh, we would like to automatize these things and in particular define exactly what we mean by this chart of material. So a bit better than just saying I want blue here and red there. So if the atomic um, number is not enough to predict properly, one may introduce new uh, players in the, in the competition. And um, which player depends now on your chemical uh, physical intuition? Uh, what I present from a certain point on is just uh, uh, some machine learning, compressed sensing that uh, compressed sensing people do not like to call it as part of machine learning, but let's say, as a matter of fact, it is machine learning. Um, uh, and, and, and this is uh, some, some automatic algorithm. But the, 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 the beginning, uh, setting up the, 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 uh, the physical problem, is our intuition that uh, does the job. Uh, the same way for uh, uh, using machine learning for learning a, a force field, the potential energy, one has to think first what information to do, given the coordinates of the uh, atoms uh, in space is stupid because you, you ask the machine learning to, to learn the symmetries, for example, while we know uh, before we start that there is translational rotational symmetry. Why should we ask the machine to learn if ever will? Um, so we have to, to put our, uh, our knowledge and intuition. Of course, uh, knowledge and intuition can be also biased and can lead to unwanted paths. Okay, so back to this problem. What is more than the atomic um, number? But not too much, because I mean, we want just to predict whether these people do rock salt or zinc blend. So we want, don't want to use too much information, like we, we make rock salt and zinc blend calculate the energy, and then we want to predict uh, whether they, they are rock salt or zinc blend. I mean, you know, maybe you know the solution, so you shouldn't do that. So what is less uh, complicated than, uh, than the crystal structure, but uh, uh, more complicated than atomic weight? Well, some property of, um, of the atoms, isolated atoms, that are calculated with the same Hamiltonian that you use to build the crystal. I mean, eventually you want to predict what happens in nature, so you need that your Hamiltonian is also good for that. But, and then you, you may use uh, homo luminization potential uh, and uh, the extension of, uh, of uh, valence orbitals uh, that you calculate with, uh, for example, LDA kind of Hamiltonian and predict um, the difference in energy between the two structures. This is the continuous uh, transformation of the problem of classification that is better suited for calculating what is on the boundary line. Here I just remind what we are talking about, about these uh, uh, properties here. So uh, if you have the constant level for one atom, you have the, the valence up there, I zoom in, and you have uh, the, the HOMO, the LUMO you have uh, a P and, uh, and, and S kind of levels, and for each of them you can uh, take out the, the radial probability density, so the, of the specific orbital, and define some radius, uh, for example, the one at which this radial probability density is maximal. And this would be one possible way to describe your atom and use this information for a prediction. So uh, this valence and uh, S and P orbital actually is not a new idea, no, not, a, not from me, at least. Uh, it was used heavily in the past. Uh, from the early 70s, people started uh, um, uh, messing around with this uh, uh, the atomic descriptor in order to predict whether you, you will form a rock salt or a zinc blend or other structure. So this is the original uh, figure from this paper in 1978. Uh, I colored it just to make it a bit more clear. And by using this uh, clever linear uh, so combination of uh, RP and RS for the atom A and B in this uh, octet binary, people, uh, uh, well, not only Chelikovsky Phillips, but many others, have done uh, plots like this, in which you have uh, uh, regions of uh, rock salt, zinc blend. So this is a chart, right? If you get a new material that lands here, most likely that would be a rock salt. 
if you get a new material that lands here or here, well, okay, here maybe there is something that you have not seen yet. Here, well, you don't know if you are in the white between here, among here, but still, uh, this is kind of uh, charts that are kind of ubiquitous, especially in materials engineering. So you find a lot of these materials charts uh, to, to, to predict property of material, and that most of them, uh, at least until the I would say late uh, 90s or beginning of 2000 were done by hand, by intuition. So we would like to kind of do this uh, uh, chart of materials automatically. So how do we do that? We start from a training set, so something for which we know already the classification or the property that we are after, calculated with some method. Here, what I want to stress is that the, the training set has to be consistent. So the, 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 the properties calculated or measured, in, if one wants to use experimental data, with the same methodology and you trust that there is the same methodology. Because if you introduce random error due to different methodologies used at once, and even different convergence levels with the same methodology, if you are using DFT, that can be hard for the machine to distinguish between what was uh, just a systematic uh, error and what is the, the actual uh, thing that you are after, the actual property that you are after. Next part, and actually the most important, is to find a descriptor. So you have already heard two talks about this. What we aim to do here is to find the descriptor automatically with some uh, preliminary considerations. For, so. Once one has a descriptor, so a way to identify typically numerical a material, one can make a table in which you have each line is a material, then you have a, a vector that identifies your material and your property. It, it is a scalar because typically you are after a scalar, but could be also a bit more complex. Then you invoke statistical learning in order to find the model that binds uh, the descriptor with the property. And the catch is that this model, once it is learned, is much faster than the, what was used to calculate the points here. I underline once it is learned. It could be that to learn it, it takes quite a while, quite a, a lot of computer time. But when you have the model and then you can use it, that's fine, because then you're faster. And you can predict something new that you have not seen before. And uh, uh, you want, at the end, to close the circle check if the, not what was predicted new is consistent with what you have uh, in, the, in the reference. So my methods that I will be describing here, uh, the first one is compressed sensing. And it starts with a, an ansatz that should be familiar to physicists that is, OK, I don't know anything about the property that they want to calculate. I expand it over a basis set. Except that here, normally, we don't really know what is the basis set. So P is the property. T are the basis functions that we call also candidate features. You will see in the few next slide what are these. That are function of some input features that we put. Then you want to learn these coefficients, same way in uh, Kerner Ridge or a Gaussian process, you learn these expansion coefficients. So your basis function are the Gaussian uh, over the data points, or some of the data points. Here you want to learn these coefficients. The catch here is that you want that only few of these coefficients are different from zero. So you want that this basis set expansion is as compact as possible. Why? From a mathematical point of view, a, a small number of coefficients here makes the model robust. So you, vo you avoid the overfitting, what Matthias was talking about in the talk before. From a physical point of view, well, maybe you can have uh, any, uh, a final expression that is easy to look into and uh, debate about. So if it contains uh, some physics. The other uh, method is uh, called subgroup discovery. This comes from data mining. Uh, for this, we had a collaboration with the um, Max Planck for, me, for informatics in Saarbrücken and the University of Saarbrücken. So the, the, the group of uh, Hilles Freken, and in particular, a postdoc of uh, Hilles uh, Mario Bolle, uh, that was at the Fritz Haber for one year while developing this methodology. This is 
uh, a very clever method uh, that tries to find local models rather than global models. So typically what we do is to find a model that is good for all the data that we have. And in this methodology, we uh, aim at finding uh, models that are good for a subgroup of data, but we want to discover also which subgroup on the line, on the fly. That's the, the catch, otherwise it would be easy. You just learn separate models and that's it. So I start with compressed sensing with a small forward on dimensionality reduction. Uh, I guess uh, Michele Ceriotti will be talking a little bit more about dimensionality reduction. Uh, but I want to introduce dimensionality reduction because, well, it was used in the past. And second, this, this problem here looks like dimensionality reduction. So if each uh, basis function is one dimension in your representation, when you do the compressed sensing, you want to, to find a low dimensional representation. So you want that only few of these coefficients are, are different from zero when you represent your data point. A different approach is uh, the, the linear dimensionality reduction that has quite some historical uh, um, uh, importance, but it's still used uh, here and there. I guess Matthias didn't go into these details, but uh, dimensionality reduction is, is used also in, in Kernel Ridge where, because you don't want to have too high dimensional things flying around. So uh, for lecture tutorial purposes, I think uh, you must know principal component analysis. Most likely you have seen already, but let me just say what it is and how it is used in this context. So it's nice to have a paper from a very long time in the past that is still can be cited in a, in a lecture in 2017. So this is by Pearson. And the principal component analysis works like this. Um, so if you have a representation in i-dimensional space, uh, you want to look for the direction in which the data are most uh, elongated. So the the standard deviation of the data, the variance, along that direction is maximal. So if you think about the cigar in high dimension, you are looking for the axis of this cigar. And then you want to look for subsequent dimensions in which, taken out the first, uh, the data are most distributed. So direction and orthogonal direction means that what we are doing is a rotation in the high dimensional space. And then we take only few of these uh, uh, dimensions. So let's look first here. That means that this makes sense if the projection uh, along this dimension that we find quickly dies off with the dimensionality. So if the, the data are spread over a, a hypersphere perfectly in the high dimension, then there is nothing that is most uh, relevant. But if it's like a cigar or something that uh, has a few relevant dimension, you find them, then you say, okay, my data live on a kind of uh, uh, hyperplane uh, with low dimension, and I can describe it. So this was actually used in the past for, for the problem of classification of rock salt versus inblend by using this as input. Valence number, energy of uh, valence uh, SNP, radius of valence SNP, so, and then some combination uh, of this uh, above makes eight dimension. So you represent your materials in eight dimension. You look for the principal components. Typically, you like that these are one or two, because more than one or two, it's difficult to make a plot out of it. So uh, with two dimensions, you get uh, rock salt here, zinc blend here, and other classes, Wurzeit, uh, that is, let's say, like zinc blend uh, yeah, for the first neighbor shell. Uh, so there is some structure, some separation. Let's say covalent here, ionic there. So it's a nice representation. If you get a new material that lands here, you are almost sure that it will be a rock salt on the basis of this. Uh, the problem here would be what is on the axis? Well, it's a linear combination of all the input because we have done a rotation in the, in the high dimensional space. So this is a kind of chart of materials, not so useful for the inside because we don't know what is on the axis. We, we can write it down, but it would be almost useless. There are no linear uh, dimensionality reduction strategies, and these are even worse from the point of view interpreting what is on the axis, because not, normally you don't even have axis. You will see with, with Michele Ceriotti. They are useful, very, very useful, this representation for, for other purposes, not for understanding why certain material would be in one class or the other. Okay, back to our method and think about the dimensionality reduction in the background. So we have this input, 
And now uh, we want to solve this problem of finding a linear combination of the above such that they can predict the property with the constraint that we want this linear combination as low dimensional as possible. So few coefficients are different from zero. And then I add already another player here. I add li nonlinear. I thought I changed this slide. Okay. Uh, focus a bit on the thousands now, uh, not on the billions of nonlinear function above, of the above. And this is done by what is called, uh, um, well, borrowing the uh, language of symbolic regression. Symbolic regression is a way to try to fit uh, data, not with uh, an answer on, the, on the, how the function is, is done, like linear or something else, but by trying to learn also the function itself out of a, of a set of functions. How do we construct the function? This is where I borrow the language from, from symbolic regression. Well, I start constructing the grammar. I make sums or absolute values of things that are the same. So if I do sum or absolute values, I don't want to sum a radius with, a, with, a, with an energy level or something that doesn't have the same kind of meaning. So I have to define class of quantities. So a grammar. Then I may want to take ratios, and now it's fine that I take a ratio of uh, radii, sum of radii divided by absolute values of, of some levels. So it may sound uh, a good uh, physical equation. And then you introduce new uh, operators, exponential powers that you can put here. The, way I, the, the reason I write this as a tree is because this is the way you code it. The, the, the nice thing of this representation is that if you take out one node of the tree and you substitute with another subtree or tree, you always get a well-formed expression. So this is a way to propagate uh, huge formulas without thinking too much. You have just to pay attention to the, to the grammar of the uh, last level when you form it. This is also not a new idea. People have been using this uh, symbolic regression but just a stochastic way to find the optimal solution under certain uh, condition in something that is called uh, Eureka, that is actually a, a, a proprietary code and is a genetic programming software. It exists still. I mean, it was a uh, science in 2009, and uh, you, 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 can, uh, you can use it. Um, and, and this is an example of application in 2014 in which uh, uh, Tim Mueller wanted to find uh, uh, what predicts uh, whether uh, certain amorphous structures of, uh, um, of, of silicon atoms have a certain uh, whole, dra whole, whole trap depth uh, that is interesting in some applications. And this is the list of, uh, uh, of some of the candidates. Uh, there were a total of, total of 242 inputs. And uh, this was the, the final formula. So you, you can uh, use this uh, stochastic approach. Um, the problem here um, um, would be uh, that, yeah, it's stochastic. So you're exploring a, a, a huge dimensional uh, um, um, function space in this case uh, by, by following uh, uh, which uh, um, formulas are more promising and, uh, and uh, substituting pieces. So there is absolutely no guarantee that you are uh, uh, going in the direction of the global optimum. You find uh, expressions, yes. And if you're fine with it, that's fine. Um, what we used is a different approach. So we wrote this, um, uh, the problem in this way. So we want to find uh, uh, the coefficients here that uh, make this uh, linear prediction, p equals cd and so on, uh, uh, as small as possible in terms of uh, root mean square error, uh, with this so-called regularization. So we pay a penalty every time a coefficient is different from 0. And this is written in mathematical terms with this 0 at the bottom. Uh, I rewrote it, the, the problem here. So this just means that we want to minimize this under a constraint that this, uh, the number of non-zero coefficient is as small as possible. This is actually we want to do what we want to do. This is called regression with L0 regularization. Um, it's fine. The problem here is that uh, the only way to solve this exactly is to enumerate all solution with one, two, three, four, five non-zero coefficients and, uh, and, uh, and compare them with one or two may be doable, the more you add, uh, the thing explodes uh, combinatorially. So typically with this 
sensible number of, uh, of D columns, uh, th this is not doable. So we need um, a way to approximate it, but to approximate it uh, in such a way that at least we can continuously go to the exact solution if we uh, tweak some parameters. Um, and one way to do this is using the so-called uh, uh, lasso. Uh, it's an algorithm in which we substitute the zero here with the one here. So the one means that we have now the Manhattan norm, the sum of the absolute values of the element of C. So with this regularization under certain condition is the same as this one, but the problem becomes convex. So now we can do a much better optimization. Also, this is not a new, new idea. Uh, there are uh, papers in the, in the, in the uh, recent past in which people use this approach uh, in order to basically uh, find a good basis sets in for, uh, for a cluster expansion. You will see cluster expansion tomorrow and I guess also some of these ideas. So this is just a teaser. Back to our lasso. So we have this uh, one regularization and this is just a kind of visual aid so that you can start thinking that you understand why this works. And it works like this. Uh, so you typically have uh, more columns than, than data points. So the problem is underdetermined. So your solution only of this part lies on an hyperplane. Now, to make it simple, the hyperplane is just a straight line. So you have only two degrees of freedom. Uh, and you want to find a solution that has the lowest L1 uh, norm. Now, in, in, in L1, the sum of the absolute values, the sphere is a square with the a vertex on the, on the axis. So you touch the line in this point in which only one of the two coordinates is switched on and the other is switched off. Well, if you would like to have uh, the, the, the lowest Euclidean uh, norm, the sphere is a circle and you touch here. So if you go to n dimensions, this is always hold. The, the L2 spheres is a sphere, as you can think of, except it is in nine dimension. Uh, but the, the L1 hypersphere is always an edgy thing that always touches a, a linear manifold on axis. So you always reduce the dimensionality by uh, having this regularization. Uh, what we actually did is not exactly this, because this works, uh, this regularization is exactly solving the L0 problem if these uh, columns here are uncorrelated. So the scalar product between pairs is uh, not close to one, but all also the scalar products of each one with all the pairs, linear combination of the pairs, linear combination of the triplets, and so on and so forth, is not close to one. So there is no linear correlation inside the matrix. Checking that there is no linear co correlation is as expensive as doing the real zero minimization. You have to check all the possible combinations. So you don't want to do that. So you have to hope that there are not high correlations. Correlations are always there, <laughs> it turns out. Uh, so what we did is to tweak a little bit lasso. So we basically uh, go to a point in which we extract uh, some candidates, many more than what we actually need, say a few tens. And then among these, we run the uh, full uh, uh, optimization by enumeration. This turns out in some control case in which we could compare the exact solution with the actual uh, the solution used with this method, found with this method, turns out to be uh, a good um, approximation, or in many cases also found the exact solution. Um, so this is what we found in this, uh, published in these two papers with this uh, lasso uh, plus L0 approach. This is a chart of Zingblend versus rock salt. So we have uh, basically what we wanted, what we asked for. Uh, here I, I use only two dimensions because again it's nice to plot on a, on a, on a, on a sheet uh, or on a, on a board and uh, we have solution with more dimensions and, and you stop the dimensionality where you want to when you achieve the accuracy that you had in mind. Now um, can one find better solution? Than, than, than what uh, Lasso can find. So the problem is, uh, again, uh, the, the functional space in which you're moving. So we present these candidates, and these candidates, if you use this L1 regularization, uh, even with the trick of uh, the, the two steps with the L0, uh, 
the, 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 the maximum number we found that is about uh, order a few thousands. What, what it means maximum number. If you go beyond that, you start getting basically kind of uh, unstable solutions. You perturb a little bit the data points, you remove one data point, you get a new solution. So you, you start thinking that this is not uh, a good approach. So we would like, uh, but, but then when you construct the, this basis function, um, you, um, I mean, few thousands is, is, is not as a, a big number once you do this uh, three construction, right? So you would like to, to have more candidates. And you easily go to billions when you start making this combinatorial uh, uh, trick of, of putting together function. So is there a way to, to have a matrix with billions of candidates here and, uh, and few uh, uh, rows and still find a kind of a, a stable solution? Well, yes. This is a recent development. So it builds on top of uh, orthogonal matching per suite that I present because it's easy to understand. And then it's, it, I hope it's easy to understand also the next step that we introduced. So this has been uh, basically, I guess, the first method. It's very naive to, 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 to uh, find solutions of, of this kind of problems. So if you look at this, Representation, so your property is a vector in a dimensional space, as many dimensions as data points. And your uh, columns here, uh, well, um, they will be vectors, of course, in, the, in this same I dimensional space. And one of them will have the largest correlation with the property. So you take out this column, and then you calculate the residuals. So basically, what is left, what the, this feature doesn't contain about the property. Then you look again at all the space and you find the next feature that is most correlated with the residual and so on and so forth. This method is called greedy. Greedy methods are all methods in which you construct the solution step by step and you cannot go back and, uh, and refine this solution. It finds always a nice solution. It's uh, unlikely that it finds the optimal solution. So the the, what we did is to say, OK, if the problem is that we cannot go back, let's have a, a way to go back. So instead of selecting the one that correlates most with the property, we select a bunch that correlates with the property, and then calculate the residual, and, and, and then select another bunch that correlates with the residual, one, two, three, and so on. And then we have a, a set of, uh, of uh, functions, of basis function, and we run by enumeration uh, the, the, the fit in order to find the, the, the group that uh, best fit our data. And it doesn't have to be, and typically it doesn't happen, that it is selected the best the best uh, in, in each uh, subgroup. It will be combinations that are in this group. This is a nice property. If you enlarge this uh, number of things that are selected, you continuously go to the exact solution. So you know that at some point the exact solution will be there. So there is only an approximation in the number of features that you extract. Uh, extract. But um, yeah, the nice thing of, of this is that um, um, it's trivially parallelizable. So it is good for um, present and future high performance computing technology uh, so that you can really have zillions, <laughs> literally, of uh, whatever zillions means, uh, of property and find uh, uh, the best among them by running in parallel. Uh, this is the performance of this other, uh, this new uh, thing. Uh, uh, compared to the old one, this is uh, the new original publication as a functional dimension descriptor, and this is the new one. Uh, and this is uh, this Eureka that I've shown a few slides before. We applied to the same problem, and uh, with, this, with 10 to the 12 uh, evaluated features, it finds this solution. It doesn't depend on the dimensionality the way we define it. With only only 10 to 11, we go much lower depending on the, on the dimensionality. Um, and this is, uh, okay, this is a reminder of uh, what was found by Lasso. And uh, with this other methodology, we find a better script in terms of uh, uh, root mean square error of the prediction. And also visually is slightly better. The green is tied to the green line. That means these are really points that are close to zero. 
and uh, you see a better layering of the solid red and, and open red that is those that are most stable in uh, zinc blend uh, uh, yeah zinc blend and those that are not so stable in terms of difference in energy so i mean we, we looked for a better solution we found a better solution the descriptor is a bit more complicated this is uh, uh, the price um, Another interesting, uh, or maybe the most interesting thing of this uh, uh, methodology, this uh, CISO methodology that was interested, this is basically the main developer, Runai Oyang. He will be tutor, hopefully, this afternoon. Um, so you can meet him. Um, is that um, instead of the root mean square error of, of, of the, some uh, um, linear uh, function here, uh, you can plug in a very different cost function to, to be minimized and uh, uh, playing the same trick with the, with the regularization. So I put this uh, plot as a reminder of what was uh, obtained in the, fa in, in the past. Now, uh, differently from uh, this uh, prediction between rock salt and zinc blend, this is more classes. So um, it would be difficult to have on the same plot uh, a linear prediction uh, uh, with more than one class, so you just want the classification. And you want to find area where uh, something is rock salt and zinc blend. So this was solved by intuition. What is not nice here is, for example, that this area are not convex. So that you basically do not really know what happens at the, at the borders. So turns out that it is somewhat easy to write down a cost function in which you ask for convex areas uh, that are not overlapping as solution of your problem. So what does it mean? For in all possible uh, descriptor representation, and I'm always talking about billions or more, question is, is there a two-dimensional or three-dimensional representation in which the data live in convex area that are not overlapping? Yes, these things can find it. This is one representation. These are rock salt zinc blend and cesium chloride uh, as found by, by Runei. The descriptor is uh, using only uh, the radii, the same as was in this uh, uh, previous work. Uh, there is also the, the d orbitals, OK? Um, a bit more complicated formula. It's, I would say, impossible to write this down by intuition. But this solves exactly the problem that we wanted uh, in, in, in this way. So uh, new points that you have not seen before, if they land in this area or this area, you know what they are classified. Um, if you land outside the area, also this is an interesting uh, outcome of the model. It tells you that most likely uh, there is something that you have not seen yet. I mean, it could be that if a point land here is just a rock salt and, and, and you have to enlarge the boundary, but it could be that if you land, uh, suppose that you didn't know cesium chloride and you land here, it could be that there is another structure that you have not seen. We actually tried. We didn't say anything about cesium chloride to our uh, training and the materials that are cesium chloride landed outside. So it doesn't have to be. But if the descriptor that is found has understood enough physics about the problem from the data, this could be. So this is a way to find new materials. Because if they land outside, it's, it's a, a, a flash, uh, blinking light saying, uh, look at this material. Do a DFT calculation, because I don't know it. It can be interesting. So these are interesting application uh, of, of this um, methodology, so beyond the kind of uh, guinea pig example. And uh, here we try to uh, find out whether the material is a, is a metal or non metal only by its formula. We limited ourselves to binary material. Uh, and actually, as you see from the data set, this comes from Springer material, so we didn't want to discuss whether the DFT level was good enough, if the K-point mesh was good enough to say whether something is metal or non-metal. We used experimental data. Um, so the materials turn out to be, in order to solve the problem, they have to be 3D really, so not layered uh, material materials um, with some other uh, little constraint, but in principle, most of the binaries are classified in, uh, uh, should be written, I haven't. So in uh, 15 different uh, uh, prototype structures. So it doesn't have to belong to a specific crystal structure. So this information is contained in the, in the, in the, 
in the formula, but we actually use this information. As you see in the, in the input, there is a ionization energy electronegativity. These are property of the atom, but we also use information from the material itself. So this is a much harder property to learn with, uh, with respect to the crystal structure classification. So we use information of the uh, material. And this was the outcome as found by Runhai. So we have uh, uh, this two-dimensional descriptor that found two uh, non-overlapping area. The, the, in the training set, the prediction is uh, 100%. So the, the, the model is 100% correct. Um, and this separation line, I will not discuss too much, is more for graphical purposes. What actually the model finds is uh, the two, non uh, two convex non-overlapping area, areas. And OK, it classifies what was put in the training set. Uh, there is an interesting uh, out of set prediction. So these three points were the only three in the, in, the, in the database in which we have the same composition. You see this one and this one and so on. Uh, but the material was uh, with a certain volume, no metal, and with a smaller volume was a metal. You see that there is an explicit dependent on the cell volume here. And these three materials were correctly predicted. So this, all the training set was using uh, information at uh, room um, pressure and temperature. And these material are metals uh, at uh, non-room pressure. So this is prediction. So the, the, the descriptor most likely has understood enough to, to do this kind of prediction. Other application is the, um, uh, the prediction whether a certain class of uh, quasi 2D honeycomb uh, materials are or not topological insulators. Uh, this was done mainly by uh, Carlos Acosta, a PhD student that stayed at the Fritz for, for uh, one year, um, I mean, visiting from, from a group in, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Christian Carbonio also you, uh, was involved. You, I think you will hear talks by him uh, in the next days. And Runai was again involved. So here uh, you have uh, uh, this, this material. The, 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 the blue and red are uh, A and B. So these are material taken from the six, second versus sixth, uh, third versus fifth group. And you have uh, hundreds of them. And they are functionalized by halogens here. So we run the, the methodology. And we find the topological insulators. Uh, uh, of two different types. This was, in, we, this was uh, a labeling that we, that, that, that we put. So the, the, the descriptor could, uh, could find them. I will not go into detail what is type 1, type 2. Uh, what is interesting is that the descriptor here depends only on A and B, so not the functionalization. And the other dimension depends on, the, on the, also the functionalization, C. So basically, where the materials are uh, in this class one or one of these three classes doesn't depend on the functionalization. So some material are always topological insulator independent of the functionalization, and some other you have to look into the functionalization. Um, also here we have prediction completely out of the sample. So you, it turns out you can, uh, predict, you can construct the same materials by putting together A and B from uh, 4, 6, and 5, 5 functionalized with the sixth, sixth group. So quite different from before, where they were functionalized by the seventh group. And well, the descriptor applies. It, it predicts uh, some topological insulator here of type 1 and 2, and some metals we tried with the FT calculation. And uh, the, the prediction is correct. So we are predicting novel materials in this case. This is purely DFT, so we don't have uh, yet the experimental uh, outcome. But still a good prediction. So now in a few minutes. I uh, should have been faster. I will introduce subgroup discovery. Um, so this is a, a methodology to find uh, uh, local models. How does it work? The best introduction is by example. Let's say that you have a property on the y-axis of some data points that are described by one control variable. These are points that are scattered here around. You want to do a linear model out of it. OK, you have the straight line here. Not a very good model, I would say. If you look into the data, you may notice that if you focus on this area here, where data have a, this, this a control variable smaller than 0 0.2, these uh, points are on a line. So for this subgroup of, uh, of uh, data points, uh, there is a very simple uh, correlation um, law from, from, from the descriptor to the property that is actually a flat line. Uh, more complicated, now you have two 
uh, control variables. The second one is just a classification and is uh, circles versus square. Now you notice that uh, if you focus on circles up there of things that are bigger than 0.8 according to the first variable, also you have a simple classification. And you write down in this way. So if x, x1 is bigger than and x2 is equal to a, I have uh, this kind of prediction. This is also a local model. What uh, subgroup discovery tries to do is to find these subgroups and their law by just looking at all possible subgroups, not true. It tries to crawl the subgroups in a, in a clever way because, again, all subgroups is a combinatorial problem as it was in compressed sensing. It has to some grammatics, so you have a population that would be here, some target variable, you decide which one you want, some descriptor variables, high dimensional typically, and you want to find proposition. Proposition are like this, x1 is bigger than, uh, x2 is equal to, uh, something else uh, uh, is in between certain values and so on and so forth. And then you have an objective function that you want to optimize such that from all possible subgroups uh, into some uh, value of the function, you actually optimize this. How does this objective function typically look like? First of all, there is always the size of the subgroup as a penalty, so the, um, if the subgroup is too small, uh, you don't get a good objective function, and this is obvious. Otherwise, if you don't put this, you always find that uh, each data point is a model by itself, and you always find the perfect model for each data point. So you have to put a penalty on the size of the Oops. Um, the other part is the part that you, which you really are interested in. So, for example, uh, this typically look a bit strange on, uh, on, on paper, one has to think about. So you want to find the reduction of variance of the population of the subgroup compared to the whole population. In this case here, if you look at the projection on the y-axis, and you think that here you have a group of points that have no variance and the other group of points that has no variance, you want to discover this subgroup, for example, so that are very narrow for this property. This was applied to the rock salt zinc blind classification, so the objective function was actually using Shannon entropy, okay, just a way to really do the, the thing uh, mathematically. Uh, in, in, in practice, the idea is really that we want to privilege subgroup in which uh, they, have the same, they, they, they have the same classification. And this is what the, the methodology found. You have zinc land versus rock salt. Now the way these are described, since we are not anymore predicting the difference in energy, but just the classification uh, is much simpler. And so one can have a lookup table very quick in which you compare the, this uh, RP uh, and RS and, and decide whether the thing are uh, or not uh, zinc land or rock salt. There is some outliers. And the interesting are in between the two groups. So it is not bad that the method didn't see the difference. Very quickly, the, the last example uh, in which you see that this methodology is very, very flex flexible. Uh, so here we had uh, uh, molecular dynamics of gold clusters. I already introduced the gold clusters in my uh, talk on, on Friday, so it shouldn't be new to you. Um, we were looking at uh, whether the cluster were uh, uh, planar or non-planar. Um, with that same data set, so this is really the data mining in which we try to find new things that were not exactly the purpose of, for which the data were, were put together, um, we, we looked uh, at, at different uh, properties using different descriptors. So uh, number of atoms, uh, the total energy of the cluster with respect to the most stable structure, and the, the interesting ones are these ones. We use the coordination histogram of the clusters uh, if you think how many two, four, three, four clusters are there and you make an histogram, you can have properties of this histogram uh, thought as a function and some other suspects. Um, what was the problem? We wanted to check uh, an hypothesis. There is rumor that uh, something that is called chemical hardness uh, that is defined here, I guess, so is uh, half of uh, LUMO minus HOMO, is correlated with the stability of the cluster. So this is with the relative energy with respect to the global mi uh, minimum at that size. Um, we stretched the definition. I mean, the, 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 the observation in the past was about local minima. Here we use uh, all clusters that, that are not necessarily minima. As you see, it's not true that there is a linear correlation on the whole data set. So we asked, is there a subset in which there is a strong linear correlation? <coughs> yes, there is. This subset here was identified 
that is a pretty good linear correlation between the two properties. And it has a weird definition. So it has to have that the, the uh, Van der Waals energy of the cluster is not very high. I mean, not very high means uh, smaller than a certain value. It has to be even numbered. And the mode of this distribution is smaller than 5. So the, peak, the largest peak is not uh, bigger than 5. Um, so for this kind of cluster, there is a strong linear correlation between uh, these two properties. So this is absolutely something you would never find, this three-dimensional object here, uh, to say that there is a high linear correlation. So you check hypothesis by, by using this methodology. Now, this I will not talk because basically this afternoon you will see in a, uh, an application, so basically you will redo uh, tutorially the, the, the prediction of rock salt versus, versus zinc blend and other crystal structures. And this will be done by using uh, the, the NOMAD uh, infrastructure. So I basically will be see, saying this thing in, in the afternoon. So I will skip some slide that you will see this afternoon, no problem. Oops. I leave the summary here and thank you for your attention.